um, invitations were sent to Senate District 14 candidates uh, and Valerie Lawson and, uh, uh, and committee ward one candidate, Michael Budzisek, have been here earlier. Um, they did not have candidates, uh, but we wanted to allow them to be seen and to state their name and their race. I don't know whether they're still on or not. Are they? Yeah. Yep, just give us a moment, we'll bring them on. Okay, because I would like them to be seen again, if possible. Uh, Ms. Lawson? Good evening, I'm Valerie Lawson. I'm a candidate for the Senate 14 seat. Thank you. Mr. Butchasek? Just a moment. Hello, I'm Professor Bazizek, and I'm a candidate for East Prime School Committee, Ward 1. My apologies for not getting your last name quite right. <laughs> it's okay, all my students seem to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. So, yes, okay. Um, this forum is being presented by the League of Women Voters in the East Bay Newspapers. Scott Pickering, general manager of the East Bay Newspapers, is our moderator tonight, our wonderful moderator, I might add. Uh, my name is Mary Chase, who represents the League, along with our comment tracker, Joanne DeVoe. Uh, she will raise her hand. Uh, I'm not seeing it on my screen, but I suppose others can. Um, and also, uh, our timers, Maureen Gomes Lopez and Earl Lopez. Uh, thank you. The East Bay Media Group, East Bay Newspapers, is hosting and recording the three forums. Uh, the League of Women Voters has been holding candidates forums at local, state, and national levels since women got the vote in 1920. It never supports or opposes candidates. Its activities include voter registration drives, studying issues important to uh, uh, the localities of its members, uh, the states or the national issues as well. They reach consensus and advocate for positions developed by this process. And we invite both men and women to join us. Uh, and you can see our website on the screen here. Uh, do consider joining us. Um, so uh, the moderator will be asking the candidates questions which have been submitted in writing. Questions may be combined or paraphrased at the moderator's uh, discretion. Each candidate will have the same amount of time to speak. Each gets an opening and closing statement and will be asked an equal number of questions. There are four additional chances of wild cards of 30 seconds each. Uh, which may be used to expand on any subject. Uh, timers and the recorder will appear on screen to alert the candidates of their time remaining. Uh, 15 seconds, and then when the red stop appears, the candidate has an opportunity to finish a, a, a sentence, but not to continue on without using an additional uh, 30 seconds or wild card. So now I will turn the program over to our veteran moderator, Scott Pickering of the East Bay Newspapers. Scott. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'll make, uh, I usually make a couple comments throughout the night. I'll make a couple here. Um, so I'll, I'll thank the league for putting this together and all the work that goes into it. Um, I show up and I'm the, I'm the pretty face, so, so to speak, but uh, they do most of the work making this happen, so I thank them. And I'll also clarify that the East Bay Media Group and East Bay Newspapers are the company name that I work for. Um, we used to be East Bay Newspapers, then we became East Bay Media Group, but what we are to most of you is the East Providence Post. So um, I, I probably should have clarified that earlier for people who are wondering who, who, what that company is. It's the East Providence Post, which hopefully you all know and love. All right, we are, uh, we're going to start with the um, at-large school committee forum. And each of you, uh, we randomly selected the order at the beginning of this. Uh, Chrissy Rossi, you uh, have the opportunity to go first. Mr. Montero, uh, you'll go second. Opening statements of up to one minute. And Ms. Rossi, take us away. 
Hi, and thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity. If any of you don't know me, my name is Chrissy Rossi, and I'm running for school committee at large. Um, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Pickering and Mary and everyone who put this together in the middle of a global pandemic. It is really important to keep everybody involved and engaged in our city politics. We're the ones who have our hand right in your pocket. So without further ado, I would like to thank you again and let's get started. Mr. Montero, opening statement. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'd first like to thank Mary Chase and the League of Women Voters for hosting the event, Scott for moderating, and my opponent for agreeing to be here. Uh, my name is Joel Montero, and I'm seeking re-election to the East Providence School Committee at-large position. I'm a graduate of 89 from East Providence, graduate of URI from 93, where I earned my business degree. I have over 25 years experience with P&L sheets, forecasting, contracting, people management, business planning, and more. I spent the last 16 years of my career with my current employer, managing our business partnerships with top medical and teaching institutions in the Northeast. My duties include fiscal planning, curriculum development, resource management, and other business needs. In East Providence schools, the progress we've made together over the last years is something we can all be proud of. I arrived when the State Budget Commission was controlling our finances due to mismanagement of funds. We are now a district with consistently sound annual fiscal performance. I'm the only candidate that voted to give our children a new high school. As co-chair of that building, I'm proud to say that it's under budget and on time. And I look forward to spending this time with you all tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start with the questions. Ms. Rossi, the first question will go to you for a one-minute response. Do you support the building of the new high school? Well, since it's already in its footprint, absolutely. It's a great looking school. It's going to be wonderful. I didn't support it at first because I thought we could spread our money around a little better, um, try and help the kids with, uh, you know, like the elementary schools and uh, Martin that needs $40 million worth of work. But since it's coming, uh, it will be my goal to have it maintained properly and uh, to let it be the shining star of our city. Mr. Montero. Absolutely. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I uh, was a big champion for it. I, uh, I pushed for the referendum. I co-chaired the building committee. Uh, I knew from all the, the facts that were prevented, uh, presented to us that investing in the old school was uh, just, just not the wisest investment for our taxpayers and that it would cost us more in the long run. It was pretty obvious, and I'm very happy to say that uh, I was right behind the best financial decision with this matter. And um, I'm looking forward to the impact it's going to have on our overall community. Thank you. Mr. Montero, what are your priorities and what steps will you take to achieve them? So I'd say, I mean, priorities as we go, again, bringing in this new school, we're going to look at curriculum development, which is done a little differently now. Um, you know, Ride now has a uh, has some say to, to standardize the curriculum. So uh, our teachers will be heavily involved, but they will have right approved curriculum. So, you know, other folks can kind of step back, let the educators step in and uh, do their vetting process to choose the right curriculum. But we, we have to be progressive with that. Um, and then overall, it's co continued communication, you know, on all fronts, uh, whether it's, you know, facilities, uh, curriculum, uh, school safety, um, finances i mean we just need to be communicating uh openly and respectfully so uh you know those i think are the two things that i would say are going to drive this district uh forward on the path that that we've been on for the last i'd say six years after the first two-year turnaround of my term Ms. rossi your, your priorities well whether you have children in the district or not this 88 million dollar budget affects every one of us. Um, my number one priority is going to be to make sure that the children are safe and they have uh, fresh, bright looking schools to attend in the safest manner possible. And after I am assured that the kids are safe, then I'm going to tear apart that budget. Um, you, you cannot present a budget with three pages and expect it to hold any water. I want to see how many six-figure salaries we have. I want to see a whole bunch of stuff that has been hidden from me for 
oh, I would say at least the last four years. Thank you. Ms. Rossi, this question is, begins with you. It's a long one. Uh, keep in mind, I didn't write all of these, um, but this is a new one for the evening. A big problem with our city is non-residents attending our schools from other cities. They register at relatives, for example, grandparents' house, but are not actually living there. With the state, the, I'm sorry, with the new state-of-the-art high school, we could see more families trying to take advantage of this. How will you help the taxpayers of East Providence to be confident that a system is in place to monitor and prevent this from happening? I would say um, if we were to take and really scrutinize registration, it needs to be more consistent and needs to be done annually. We have kids that come in and we don't really check enough. Um, they come in, they do their thing, they ride it for you know, 10, 12 years, whatever they came in at and we don't do a lot of follow-up. I don't know if we don't have enough staff to get the job done. Maybe we need a couple of dedicated people to make that happen. It's a huge drain on the system. I agree with that 100%. I would like to see what we have in place and then improve upon it so that we can uh, finally let some of this burden go. Mr. Montero? Sure, I'd say uh, you know, community communication is gonna be a big part of that. Uh, we actually do um, registration, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, residence verifications annually. Uh, everyone is expected and uh, required to submit. Every student is required, myself included, uh, believe it or not. So um, that is being done. It is a strain. We are going to have to be, uh, uh, you know, very disciplined in that. But as a community, we have to protect our investment and, uh, you know, maintain the space for, for our residents. Mr. Montero, next question begins with you. Do you have any critiques of how the school department has handled the reopening of schools this fall? Is there anything you would like to do differently? Uh, I mean, that's that's an easy no. And, you know, this was was no no game plan for this. You know, uh, this is uh, has never happened before. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of what the administration um, you know, Superintendent Crowley putting this with Dr. Ferrand and the team that, that she built and, uh, you know, Ride recognized that the plan that East Providence had was uh, superior to, to all others and actually a model for some. Um, you know, I, I commend not only the administration, but every employee group that we have that was willing to do whatever we could to educate any child that wanted to be in the building. Um, you know, that's a Herculean task and um, they, they stepped up and they continue to uh, kind of navigate, right? I mean, there are obstacles and uh, floating up every day, but, but they're, they're working very hard and I really can't thank them enough. Um, and I know there are families out there that can't thank them enough either. Ms. Rossi? I cannot say enough good things about Sandy Ferran and how her and her team put this together. <clears throat> Excuse me. These the teachers, the staff, our maintenance staff, everyone has put in 110%. And I don't know why we haven't even thought about giving them hazard pay because they're putting themselves in jeopardy, they're putting their families in jeopardy, and they're all doing this for the good of our children. We've got at least half of our student body out on distance learning, which has made it a little bit easier, I think, to control but none of this would have been possible without Sandy at the helm making things happen like she did. Thank you. Ms. Rossi, next question begins with you. If the similar subject, if school buildings are forced to close once again, like they did in the spring, do you have confidence that the district is ready to respond and administer a quality educational program? I think we'll do everything humanly possible to make sure our kids get some semblance of an education, but you cannot, I, listen, I'm a big proponent of public schools. And unless these um, little bottoms are in their little seats every day, they're just not getting the same education. It's super important to get them into school, but not to rush through it. It really needs, I don't think anybody could get a quality, a perfect education from a computer, from sitting at a laptop all day. I want these kids back in school, but it has to be safe. Mr. Montero? 
Sure. I'd say that, you know, what parents saw in uh, what they experienced in March, what parents and students experienced in March um, was uh, on the fly. It was an emergency. Uh, you can see now that distance learning is much more developed. And uh, I know that the district is preparing for that situation. Um, and I have full confidence that the level of distance learning that would be executed if we were forced to stay home would be uh, uh, would be done to the to the standard greater than any other district in the state, and um, they do the best that they can as they have been. Next question, Mr. Montero. Last one on the COVID nineteen subject: Are the demands placed on teachers during the pandemic realistic, or are we asking too much of the teachers? Are the demands realistic? Uh, I guess it depends on on uh, who's making the demands, right? And it comes down to communication. I think that uh, we as a school committee and administration uh, are trying to be uh, as understanding this as possible. And so I think those demands are realistic. I think it's important for parents to um, maintain a realistic uh, expectation um, on these teachers. So, I mean, it's, it's not fair what they have to do. And I mean, they're, they're heroes. You know, we talk about first responders and rightfully so through this pandemic. Um, you know, these teachers are learning how to um, execute their craft in a way that they've never done it for the most part. So, um, you know, it, it's just important that we have patience and, and we've shown that and uh, they're rising above. So they're exceeding expectations as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I couldn't ask any more from them. Thank you. Ms. Rossi? Would you mind just repeating that, please? Sure. Are the demands placed on teachers during the pandemic realistic, or are we asking too much of our teachers? We're definitely asking too much of our teachers, but as usual, our East Providence teachers just keep rising to the occasion. They do the best they can with what they have, no matter the circumstance. I would like to see um, maybe a little less asked of them and asked of the parents. You have parents trying to help their kids navigate um, a workload on a laptop. They're not prepared to do. The curriculum changes all the time. And math looks nothing like what it did when I was in school, I can tell you that. So I think in, in aggregate, everybody's being asked to do too much, but in typical towny fashion, our teachers are making it happen once again. Thank you. All right, new question. Ms. Rossi starts with you. In the current racial climate, how will you work to promote diversity in interactions, programs, and curriculum? We should, and I, I don't know if we do or not, but we should have some sort of outreach team. Um, I know that the mayor just put one together. So if we could piggyback off of that, why recreate the wheel? Let's just keep it going. I think it's super important to have diversity in our schools. I think it's super important that our littles get to look at people who look just like them, just bigger. I think that's very important. So um, I don't know what is uh, currently being done. Whatever it is, I'm sure we can do better because the diversity level is not um, stellar. I think we should uh, take a look at what the mayor's got going on and jump on that bandwagon. Mr. Montero. Sure. Um, so this is obviously near and dear to me um, of the, in the history of East Providence. I am only the second person of color to ever serve on the school committee uh, in a city that has been uh, diverse uh, um, for far four more years than, than I've been around. So um, I've, I've made it a point to bring this to the superintendent and I actually wanna thank the administration. Uh, one of the things uh, at, at my request working with the administration that we did in the district is we brought forward two programs that we are running, or we, we ran two and one is continuing this year. Uh, last year there was uh, basically an, an equ the Equity Institute did a program with our uh, staff to talk about uh, sensitivity. Um, and again, it, it's, it's cross-directional. Uh, and then in addition to that, what is still going on is Diversity Talks, which is a student-led discussion type program and bringing in students from all different backgrounds, 
you know, it's not just differences of race or color. Uh, they're they're uh, just really um, uh, just exploring and celebrating the diversity of East Providence. But we can do more, and this is just a drop in the bucket of the direction that we need to go. Uh, but as a city, we need to um, insist that we have the representation from our, di our, our diverse community because it is the strength of, the, of, of who we are and who we will be. And uh, I'm very, very proud of it. And um, I look forward to doing even more and, and getting that representation in the buildings. You know, we've got to work harder to get uh, teachers and administrators uh, that represent the students that they're facing. Um, to me, that's, that's the next key step. Thank you. Uh, we charge. We should charge uh, Ms. Montero another wild card there as well, for the for the scorekeeper. Um, okay. Next question, Mr. Montero, begins with you. Do you think the district is doing enough to address special education needs at home with parents in the current environment? So I'm going to take that to mean for distance learning uh, students in special education is a district doing enough? Uh, I think the answer is no. And I would expect that, and, and I mean that respectfully, I would expect that the district uh, would would agree. With that. Um, it's not a question of is the effort there, is a willingness there. I think that the district, again, through communication, um, we can do more. Uh, we talked about it last night at our meeting. Uh, it came up and what was stressed is that when uh, families have concerns, it is critical that they raise those concerns, not to uh, the channels that are just sounding boards, but to the channels that can link them with the resources to address their concerns. And I've had a high level of success, uh, not solving the problem because that's not my background, but with linking folks, families, students with the resource that can address their issues and the response has been very positive. And that's what we need to keep doing so that we can improve every day. Ms. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Rossi. I'm probably going to burn quite a few of my extra times. So let me just start with a resounding no. We never do enough for our special education. Um, last night I watched the meeting till, oh goodness, it must have been almost 11 o'clock. And the, the response I saw was if parents of special needs children aren't willing to speak to the administration, then they are not truly searching for an answer. Let me say, I hope everyone's children are as healthy as they can be. But if you are a parent of special needs children and you're trying to go to an IEP meeting, there's about 13 people from administration, teachers, it's frightening, it's terrifying for special needs parents. And I'll tell you what, I am going to hold their hand if I'm elected. I'm not just gonna pass the email along to admin. I will hold your hand and follow up and make sure that your child gets everything that your child deserves. And in this pandemic, we have not even scratched the surface of what we could be doing for these children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you didn't use as many wild cards as you thought. So you just George, you want, yeah, Mr. Montero, please. I just want to uh, kind of touch base and this kind of connects to the opening of schools. And this was one of the reasons, a very big reason as to why I was a proponent of parent choice, uh, which was not the case for my opponent who uh, basically felt that we were crazy to even think of trying to open the schools. You know, the, these families are struggling. Um, there are needs that, that our students need, special ed and regular, but in this case, to this point with special education, um, you know, denying services is not the direction to go in. Ms. Rossi, do you want to respond to that? I disagree as usual with my opponent's assessment. Okay. Uh, okay. New, new question. Ms. Rossi begins with you. Resource officers are an important part of school order, safety, and support for children and teachers. During these difficult times, will you continue to support resource officers? If not, what would you do to replace them? Oh no, I would like more of them. We live in crazy times. It's not just COVID. Our, our babies are at risk every day from some wild idiot coming in there to take them out. It's not, 
it's not a good place right now in our country. Um, and COVID's not going to last, last forever. I would venture to guess um, that our resource officers are going to be even more crucial going forward. So I would support them 100%. Mr. Montero? Uh, I support them 100%. And I think safety is the obvious reason. But I will say right now, if you look at the climate of this country, uh, we talk about diversity uh, and communication and the tension in this country. Uh, SROs are critical to the development of community relations. And they're interacting interacting with these young people at a critical time to build that relationship, to break down barriers. And the good, we have good SROs in our schools. And that's what I see them doing, is they're communicating. They're not just troubleshooting, but they're communicating and breaking barriers. Thank you. New question. Actually, last question, believe it or not. This is flying by. Uh, so, Mr. Montero, we begin with you. Uh, we hear a lot about CTE and CTC programs. Is the district doing enough to prepare students for 21st century careers? So again, enough. I don't think there's ever enough. Uh, you know, in everything we do, we strive to do more. Uh, we're growing the, the CTE programs. Uh, we did add electrical last year. Uh, in the new building, uh, there are plans uh, to add other how am I at 15 seconds already? But uh, uh, keep going. You got more time. All right. To, to add uh, to add other trades, uh, plumbing, uh, you know, HVAC, and so forth. But one of the things that we need to do is there's a scheduling shift that needs to happen at the high school to allow to allow block scheduling, which will lengthen those programs so that we can do um, collaboration with local businesses uh, for for uh, you know job site training and and you know mentorship and you know, whatever that is. Right now, that's a limitation and we can do better with that. Uh, you know, it was mentioned in an earlier discussion about uh, the businesses, but until we uh, allow that, um, it's it's a challenge. Uh, it's, and, um, you know, we'll, we've got to get there. So there's some work to be done, but I'm very proud. And I think this, uh, this school is going to be um, a, an attractor um, for, uh, students um, really wanting to come and learn in East Providence. It's going to be a big piece of it. The CTC program is going to be a big, big piece of that. Right. Uh, Ms. Rossi. I can tell you that I have had this conversation with um, Mr. Ferreira for probably the last eight years. When I was in school, we had, it was almost like a work release program. We could go out, uh, leave school early, go downtown, work in the buildings, learn skills, learn trades. We don't, we don't offer that to our kids anymore. And it's, a, it's been a scheduling issue for over eight years. And I just don't understand what the problem is. In eight years, we haven't figured out how to fix a block so that these kids could leave and go and learn something. We've also got unions that are willing to work with us and train these kids and get them in early. I mean, not everybody wants to go to college, believe it or not. Some kids would be making $38 an hour driving a backhoe and more if you're good at it. So there's a lot more we can be doing for our children. Um, I think pushing college, pushing college is great for some children, not all of them. I would like to see more done for CTC. All right, thank you. I'm gonna throw a wild card here as moderator since I, um, I do have the ability to add more time to the evening. Um, and we are ahead of schedule. Uh, but for the audience, we're going to wrap fairly soon. I'll ask one more question to both of you um, with a one minute answer, uh, beginning with uh, Ms. Rossi. Why are you a better choice for this seat than your opponent? Because I tell everybody everything and I tell it in a way that they can understand it. I have found um, that our school committee currently the school committee majority has a bad habit of keeping everything under the rug. And someday it's gonna crawl out from underneath the rug and bite us. It's important, super important, to keep our community involved in the conversations, to engage our community, not to not keep them away from the schools. We don't have, I mean, right now it's COVID, so we can't, but we don't even have the volunteers we used to have because everything's hush, everything's quiet. I want to open the shades and let everybody see what's going on inside. And I want them to come and help us to make our kids 
better places to go to school. Mr. Montero. Repeat that for me, if you will. Uh, why are you a better choice for this seat than your opponent? Uh, so if I look at my professional experiences, I would apply them directly to this budget management, forecasting, planning, uh, curriculum development uh, with higher level institutions. Um, I do have a, 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 a trade background, but you know, it's, it's the business mindset. There are three, three priorities for this position and that's manage the superintendent, manage the budget, manage policies. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, we've seen the time where there was uh, micromanagement in the district and um, it, it, it doesn't go well. But those skill sets apply. We're talking about collaboration. You know, with the new legislation we have, fortunately, we have SIT teams now at each school, which brings the community in. And we also have a, um, a district SIT team that meets with administration. So that communication is, uh, is going to improve and it's going to be key to that. But, uh, you know, my, my, my job, my skill is collaborating and putting resource, resources together. And uh, that's where I see things kicking in. Thank you. Uh, I'll give 30 seconds to 30 seconds more to each of you if you'd like, Ms. Rossi. Thank you. I was trying not to um, throw all of my my background in there. I did construction for 20 years. I was the person out in the trailer doing all the accounting for all of the big jobs. I don't know if you've heard of a little job called Twin River. I did all the accounting for that and other projects, but I do have a, a decent enough skill set and I've managed to balance the city budget twice with the fiscal advisor, Paul Luba. Um, I would say I, I have some skills to add to the program. Thank you. Ms. Montero, any, any last word? No. We still have closing statements after this. I'm good. Okay. All right. We're going to move to closing statements. 30 seconds for each of you. Ms. Rossi, you, uh, you, you go first. Thank you. Um, again, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, Joel, you too. Thank you. Um, I would like to say in closing that we can do better. I want to help us do better. Um, I want to help us be more transparent, such as um, the interview process with the new principal for the high school. We had a perfectly good townie ready to go. And some, for some reason, we went out of district. I think it's important to promote from within. I think it's important for our children to have a really safe place and a bright, clean, happy place to go to school. And those are just some of the really big things that I would like to see going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pinchero. Sure, I would like to thank my family uh, for putting up with me in this uh, role for eight years. Uh, it's definitely a commitment uh, by everyone. And uh, I would like to thank you all for hosting this, my opponent for showing up. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important to note that for the first time in a long time, the, uh, the voters have a, have a choice from two candidates who have both done the job, okay? My opponent did leave the district in 2012 by choice. This is the only seat that I've ever sought, the only seat I've ever filled. And if you look at the financial situation of the school department in 2012, where there was no transparency to the budget, there was no money, we had a budget commission in place, to today, where we actually are investing surplus dollars into capital investments, capital improvements, then um, I stand on that and I hope the voters will recognize that and I look for their vote today through the 3rd of November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, good job, both of you. Uh, Mary Chase, I turn it over to you momentarily. All right, well, again, Thank you candidates for appearing for all of your work and aspirations and uh, thoughtful answers. Um, and Scott and uh, all of the league, Joanne and Earl and Maureen and Faye, thank you all for your help in putting this on. Uh, the recorded forum, as I mentioned before, will be available tomorrow, that's October 15th. It'll be on the league website, lwvri.org, uh, with links to Facebook and YouTube. And you don't have to wait until November 3rd to vote. You can vote early in person now at City Hall, 
during business hours by mail or by leaving your mail ballot in the lockbox at East Providence City Hall, 145 Taunton Avenue. Of course, you can also vote at your polling place on November 3rd. In any event, um, be sure to cast your vote. And thank you all, and good night.